So today's vlog features a special guest, which some of you guys might be familiar with, but maybe not some of you newer subscribers. Say hi to Megan back here. <laughs> That's my girlfriend. Sometimes she comes on trips with me, which is always fun. But let me give you guys a little update about this one in particular. So we missed our flight out of LAX this morning. Uh, ended up having to book a new flight later in the day, which was actually a connecting flight through Fresno, where somewhere along the line, they lost our luggage. So now here we are with no luggage and a whole lot of unforeseen expenses as far as airplane tickets and going to the store for clothes. But hey, at last, we made it. So yeah, San Francisco, California. And let me give you guys a little view from the hotel room because it's way too pretty not to show you guys. It's hard to complain about a view like this and we're just gonna enjoy the city. However, can't keep me away from a poker room too long and Megan's down to watch me play one session of poker. So that's what tomorrow is gonna be about. I'm gonna head to Lucky Chances, which as far as I gathered is pretty much the only local option for live poker. So I figured why not swing by and see what's going on there. Hopefully we can get a 510 going, although I heard that that's not really too common, but that's what I'd like to play and maybe a few people might come out to uh, partake with me in that game. So yeah, that's pretty much today's plans. I'm gonna do my best to show you guys the, uh, the views from the city and who knows, maybe I might win a few hands at poker as well. All right. Let's get to the casino. Upon arriving at Lucky Chances Casino, I was greeted with the pleasant surprise that there's actually a pretty long list for the 510 game. So we got that going and it's a 500 minimum, no max game. I decided to buy in for $3,000. And in the first interesting hand of note, there's two limpers and I look down at King Queen in late position. I raise it up to $50. The button makes the call and now the small blind raises to 215. The limpers fold and action gets back to me. Kind of a close spot here, but being pretty deep and in position, I decide to make the call and the button calls as well. So three ways to a flop, which comes down queen six three with two spades. The pre-flop aggressor decides to check it over to me. And now it's a question of whether I want to bet or not. Being that this is a re-raised pot, it's not even guaranteed that I do have the best hand. So exercising a little bit of pot control seems more than reasonable. So that's what I do. I check it and now the button decides to quickly move all in for around $800 or $850. Action's on the small blind now and he decides to get out of the way. But when the action gets to me, I will not be folding. Even though it is a pretty big all in, he could be doing this with a variety of worse hands. So I quickly make the call and we're off to the races. The button shows king jack of spades. So we're definitely not out of the woods yet, but the turn is a king and the river is a red three. So we're gonna take down the first pot of the day. In the next hand, there's an early position open to $30. A player in middle position calls and the button calls as well. I look down at ace, 10 of diamonds and the small blind. I decide to put in the re-raise here, being that there's some dead money behind from the callers and we have a suited ace. Seems like a good candidate to me. So I make it 170 and surprisingly all three players behind make the call. So I'm pretty much done with it here unless we flop something pretty damn good, but that's not the case. It's queen jack six with two hearts. So not too much hope for my hand unless I turn a king or maybe an ace. But anyway, not much to do except check it and the action checks all the way around. Turn card doesn't seem too bad. It's the nine of spades giving us an open-ended straight draw now. 
Once again though, I'm not going to try to bluff into three people out of position, especially on a turn that could improve a lot of their holdings as well, so I decided to check it again. A little bit surprisingly however, that action checks all the way around for a second time. Off to a river which is the eight of spades now, so the backdoor flush does come in as well as the obvious straight draw for anyone who has a 10. Now you might think, okay, now we've got a straight, it's time to bet, and I wouldn't really fault that line of thinking, but being that this is a four-way pot and I would almost never have a 10, I think the most logical and maybe profitable play as well is to just check it, and maybe one of these guys will use this card as a bluff card. I know I would definitely be thinking about it, even if I didn't have a 10, so I decided to check it for a third time and get a little bit sneaky, but once again, I'm a little bit shocked that the action checks all the way down. And based on that action, I think it's clear we've got the winner. And indeed, we're going to take this one down. So not a ton of action, but happy to take it. In the next hand, there's an early position open to $35. Player middle position makes the call, and I look down at 9-7 of hearts in late position. I actually decide to get a little bit frisky here and raise this one up. I think flat calling an early position raise with this exact hand is probably not too great. Folding seems to make the most amount of sense, but as you guys can probably guess, if it's being highlighted in the vlog, I did not fold it. So I decided to take the aggressive route and raise it up to 170. Action gets back to the initial raiser who makes the call, but the player behind him gets out of the way. So heads up here to a flop of king, nine, deuce with one heart. He checks it over to us. We have middle pair and some backdoor possibilities. I'm more than happy to continue with a small bet. So I put out $115 and my opponent makes the call. Off to a turn card here, which is an interesting one. It's the Ace of Diamonds. Once again, he checks it to me, and now it's a question of whether we want to continue betting or just check it back and try to get to showdown. We got a little bit of showdown value with a 9, but being that he called a re-raise pre-flop and then called a bet on the flop, seems pretty unlikely that it's the best hand. However, even if our hand is not best, we don't necessarily have to bluff this exact turn. We can still see what he does on the river and maybe win it then. And I would often be checking back an ace here anyway, which I think my opponent knows. So I decided to check it back and try to figure this one out on the river, which is the Jack of Clubs. Now he comes out and bets $120. Pretty small bet relative to the size of the pot. And my instinct here is that he's just putting out a block bet with a hand like maybe King Queen or King 10 suited. Perhaps even a weak ace, but for the most part, I don't perceive this to be a strong hand. So now we're in a little bit of a weird spot, as is often going to be the case when you re-raise pre-flop with 9-7. But I think the best way to salvage this hand is turn this hand into a raise. We have some removal to two pairs and sets, holding a 9. And let's just be honest, we could have a lot of strong hands on this board, which my opponent should be aware of. So I decide to raise it up. I make it 540. And now he starts thinking about it for a while, before eventually flashing the king of spades, before doing anything. So at the very least, whether he ends up calling or folding, it's nice to know that the situation was read correctly. And even better, that he actually does end up folding after a few seconds. So 9-7 works out this time, but could have easily been a disaster. In the next hand, the straddle is on, and I look down at King-9 of hearts from early position. I make it 50 bucks, and only the big blind makes the call. Heads up to a flop of Queen-9-6 with two clubs. He checks it to me, and much like the previous hand, we have middle pair, which can use some protection, especially on a board that has a ton of draws. So I decide to bet $35, and my opponent proceeds with a call. Turn card is the three of diamonds, and once again, he checks it over to me. Not really expecting to get called by words two times here, so I decide to check it back and see what he does on the river, which comes the deuce of diamonds. Now my opponent decides to bet $120. And I'm looking at this board realizing that pretty much every single draw on planet Earth breaked out here, including Jack-10, 8-7, flush draws, etc, etc. So if he's got a queen or anything better than a 9, really, I'm happy to pay it off. So that's what I do. I put in the 120, and this time it works out as my opponent shows 8-7 of clubs. Which I think is actually a favor against my hand on the flop. So nice to hold up against a huge draw like that. In the next one, we make life a little bit easier by looking down at pocket kings in the small blind. 
There's a middle position open to $30. I make it $120 and he makes the call. Heads up to a flop of 10-6-5 rainbow. My pair is still bigger than all the cards on the board, so I think putting in a bet is more than reasonable. I throw in $145 and I'm happy to see my opponent makes the call. I'm not so happy, however, to see the 10 of clubs on the turn. I wouldn't really have a 10 too often, aside from maybe ace 10 suited, or perhaps jack 10 suited, but for the most part, it's going to be a better card for him than me. So I decide to check it now and see what he does, but I feel a lot better about it once he checks it back. River card is pretty interesting now. It's the 5 of clubs, which brings in the backdoor flush as well as pairs the board for a second time. Against this player in particular, I didn't really get the feeling that he would bluff with missed draws or try to use this board to turn his hand into a bluff necessarily. So I think it's best to just put in a bet and hope to get called by a pocket pair, maybe a non-believing six. So after thinking for a few seconds, I decided to throw in another bet of $320, but he quickly just shows me the ace of clubs and ends up folding. In the next hand, there's an early position open to $30, Player in middle position calls and I look down at King Jack in the small blind. I decide to raise it up and make it $170. Probably fine to just fold this hand like 90% of the time, especially against an early position open, but I'm in the mood for some gambling. So I raise this one up and only the initial raiser makes the call. So heads up here to a flop of Ace King 6 with two diamonds. Even though it feels a little bit silly to bet middle pair, this is just a board where I should be betting almost all my holdings for a small sizing. So I decided to do just that. I put in $110 and my opponent makes the call. Turn card is the 10 of spades and now it's fine to check this hand in particular. We have a decent strength hand which can sometimes win at showdown but not really get too much value from worse. So I decided to check it now. However my opponent does not. He throws in a bet of $520 and my initial reaction is that we should just be making our decision here based on the sizing that we're facing. Against a smaller size like one third or maybe even half pot think it's more than okay to continue, but against this pretty big sizing, I think we have to let this one go. So that's what I do, but the second I do that, my opponent decides to own me by showing me the 8-7 of hearts. Nice hand. Moving right along to the next hand, which was a pretty tricky one, I think. The straddle is on in this one, and we see an early position open to $60. Middle position now makes the call, and I look down in the small blind at pocket eights. You guys might have heard me say this before, but I'm not a huge fan of calling from the small blind. However, we're pretty deep here, and this player in particular who raced to 60 from early position hadn't really played any hands. She had been pretty quiet the entire evening, limping a lot, and not really getting out of line, so I don't necessarily want to re-raise her. At the same time, I don't really want to fold this hand, so that just leaves one option, even though I'm not in love with it. So I make the call, and we're three ways here to a flop of 8-7-5 with two clubs. Instantly regretting my decision to not re-raise pre-flop, not being results oriented or anything though. I check it over to her, now it's fingers crossed that she's got an over pair. Unfortunately she checks it right away, and now the player behind her decides to put in a bet of $70. Action gets back to me and now it's just time to go for the raise, so I make it 280 the initial raiser folds, but now the player in middle position calls. So heads up here to a turn which is the 10 of spades. Doesn't really change too much aside from us losing now to a hand like pocket 10s or perhaps jack 9 which is a two-way straight draw on the flop. But aside from those we should still have the best hand and there's still plenty of other hands to get value from. So I decided to continue betting. I like to bet around two-thirds the size of the pot, $550 and once again my opponent makes the call. So a pretty sizable pot brewing and we're off to see one last card which I'm hoping is a clean one. But unfortunately, it's not. It's the deuce of clubs completing the obvious flush draw. Now it's pretty unlikely we're going to get called by a worse hand. So I check it over to him. But he does not check. He decides to put in a bet to the tune of $900. And even though I've got a set, it's a pretty nasty spot here. I think the only way our hand is good is if my opponent is deciding to turn a hand with a 9 into a bluff. But the thing is, most of those hands would be paired up. Like 9-8 perhaps 10-9, etc. And most people are just happy to check back when they have a pair in hopes that they win the pot. And not only that, but people don't really bluff on rivers too often, especially after I've shown quite a bit of strength on previous streets. On the other hand, we're getting a pretty good price to call. I think we've only got to have the best hand like one out of four times, given that we're facing around a half pot sized bet. So I gotta be honest, you guys know I'm not really a huge fan of making big folds. But I just got the feeling that almost every time 
we were going to get shown a flush here. So I end up deciding to fold. And my opponent shows me 9-7 of clubs. So he did have a flush. And I finally make a good fold. <laughs> Just kidding. He actually showed 9-7 offsuit with one club. And now you guys get to see yet another example of why I'm always paying people off. <sighs> My opponent's name in this hand is Kevin. He wanted to make sure that I gave him a proper shout out for completely wrecking me in this hand. So Kevin, well played. So even though the session started off very smoothly, things got a little bit rocky in the past few hands. So what better cure than pocket aces in a straddled pot, no less. I'm first to act in this hand. So I raise it up to $50 playing 5, 10, 20 and get called by the small blind and the straddler. Three ways in position to a flop of king, six, three with two spades. Small blind checks it, and now a little surprisingly, the straddle decides to lead for $60. Not sure exactly what he has, but whether it's top pair or a flush draw, perhaps even a straight draw, aces rate to be the best hand almost every time. So I decide to raise it up. I make it $200. Small blind gets out of the way, and now the straddler decides to make the call. Now I think it's most likely he's got a hand like king, queen, perhaps king, jack which is always a dream situation when we're holding pocket aces. Until, of course, the turn is the king of diamonds, pairing the top card. And on top of that, my opponent decides to add a little bit of insult to injury and lead out once again, despite the fact that I raised him on the flop. He throws out $300, and I think it's just time to let it go now. I'd almost rather have a hand that can improve more easily, like maybe some straight draws or flush draws. So, uh, yeah, just a long-winded way of saying I let out a small chuckle and just decided to fold. And when my opponent went to fold his cards, he accidentally fumbled them. They flipped over, and sure enough, he had king-queen offsuit. I felt a little bit bad because he wasn't necessarily trying to show me, but he was sitting right next to me, and I saw them. So, sorry, man. But anyway, pocket aces don't work out, and that was the last hand of the night. So shortly after that, I decided to rack up, call it a night, and book a decent little win here in this 5-10 game. I hope you guys like those hands. Well, that was a lot of fun. Somehow she endured five hours of that. <laughs> uh, it wasn't that bad. Right, but at least the bottom line was a positive one. I was in for 3,000, cashed out for 4,169. Hard to complain about winning a thousand bucks, but uh, it's time to go get some dinner and enjoy San Francisco. I don't really want to spend our entire vacation locked up in a poker room, even though somehow she was down for it. <laughs> Anyway, pretty normal session. I guess the only complaint was getting completely owned by Kevin when I folded pocket eights. He was so proud to show me the, the nine seven offsuit. So <laughs> had to let him have his moment. But anyway, that's it for tonight. Um, what's coming up next is I will be in Texas in a few days. Here are the exact dates right on, right on, right on his face. Uh, those are the exact dates. I'm gonna be playing one three, Five five on the live stream uh, and some other stuff, but I'll give you guys more details on that in the next vlog. But yeah, until then, thank you guys so much for watching. I believe the next vlog might be me playing 510 at the bike, so maybe I'll see you guys there. And uh, yeah, as always, if you give this video a thumbs up, I really appreciate it. And uh, I hope you guys enjoyed Megan. Rude. I hope you guys enjoyed Megan being featured in this one. For all you OG subscribers, you've seen her before, but. <laughs> but for all you new guys, she's already taken, sorry. Alright, see you guys next time. Good luck at the tables. Peace.